Please take your Bibles and turn over to the book of Revelation. We're starting a new church tonight. <laughs> no, not here. And we certainly don't want to start one like this church, the church at Thyatira. But uh, we're starting the study of our fourth church in the series, the church at Thyatira, part one tonight. And we're in Revelation chapter two, and I'll be reading verses 18 through 29. Revelation chapter two, verses 18 through 29. <clears throat> God's word for his people. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. But that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for its power. A church which had so many incredible, positive character qualities commended by Christ a church known for their works of service to Jesus Christ and the latter to be more than the first. But a church with a very serious problem. A warning for all churches. Oh, Father, Pergamos was the seat of Satan but here at Thyatira, we have the depths of Satan. We pray, Father, that in your mercy and grace, you might cause us to be warned and to have wisdom from this portion of your word. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Now you're probably noticing something as we read through that passage here a moment ago. There are some things in here that are parallel exactly with what we saw at Pergamos, the church right before this one. In particular, as we see here in verse 22, it talks about committing adultery, and it also talks about fornication, and it also talks about things sacrificed unto idols. A church that had problems that we saw with Pergamos, because we saw the fornication and the things sacrificed to idols, not just with Pergamos, but now with Thyatira. We're going to be talking about that a little more in just a few moments. But first of all, let me remind you of some of the key issues that we have seen so far in these seven churches and the connection between the first three, which gives us the introduction to church number four. We're obviously looking at the seven churches where Jesus Christ himself sent the letters. This is not just, you know, oh, the book of Revelation and these are some interesting things about the churches. Jesus himself is speaking to the churches. And he's not just speaking to the seven churches there because at the end of each one, let every one of the churches know what the Spirit is saying. We find that at the end of each discussion, each letter to each of the different churches. So that means it's for us as well. First church we saw was Ephesus. Second church was Smyrna. Third church was Pergamos. Smyrna was the martyr church sandwiched between Ephesus and Pergamos. The Nicolaitans tried to infiltrate the first church, Ephesus, tried to infiltrate that third church, Pergamos. They failed at Ephesus, but they had wild success at Pergamos. But in the end, both of those churches were killed by the devil. The church he couldn't get was Smyrna in the middle. There's still an active population of nominal Christians, at least. They go by the name of Christian in Smyrna of between 200,000 and 300,000 people, but there are no more of the church at Ephesus or Pergamos. Now, how did the devil manage to get Ephesus and Pergamos? We asked that question, but he failed to get Smyrna. The short answer is he used different methods. Two methods worked and the third method did not. The one that didn't work was the method at Smyrna, which was persecution. And we talked about six positive effects of persecution. I won't go over those again, but if you don't, well, I tell you what, who didn't hear the six positive benefits of persecution? Anybody? You all know the pot? Okay, so I'll go over them again real quickly because we spent some time on this. But six positive effects of persecution. Number one, intense persecution only hardens the resolve of true believers to be faithful to Christ. It separates them out. Number two, intense persecution only clarifies the focus of true Christians as to what is important and what is worthless in this life. Number three, intense persecution only brightens the prospect of heaven and makes worldly things grow dim. Number four, intense persecution removes the chaff from the church, the nominal Christians, and leaves the real Christians behind. That way the real Christians know whom they can trust and they really develop a bond of love and sacrificial service for one another. Number five, intense persecution only makes real Christians cherish the Bible and prayer and fellowship more. And number six, intense persecution only makes real Christians more attractive to their neighbors who see them suffering for something that is real and that has meaning. That means that the lost people who are searching for truth will be open to the gospel and will give the real Christians opportunity to witness, and that's why the church always grows in times of persecution. Because the world suddenly sees there is something worth dying for, something that lasts forever. So we tried to answer the question, if you recall, so if that's all true, then why does the devil still use intense persecution if it makes the church grow? And Jesus gave the answer we saw it in John 8, 44, your year of your father the devil, he's speaking to the Pharisees, and the loss of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. So the short answer is, why does the devil still use it even though it makes the church grow? 
Why does the devil still kill the Christians? Because the devil loves to kill God's people. That's the short answer. Even though he knows it won't stop them. He is a murderer from the beginning. He revels in human blood. We talked about this morning that when we were talking about the spiritual warfare that we're in. Did you notice what Jesus said? He said that the devil was a murderer from the beginning. That's a reference to Cain and Abel, and it explains why the devil still kills Christians in China and North Korea and all the Muslim, Hindu, and Buddhist countries around the world. Remember the beginning? Eve had two boys, Cain and Abel. Cain was a farmer. Abel was a shepherd. God told them to bring a blood sacrifice, and Cain brought vegetables. Abel brought a lamb. God rejected Cain. He accepted Abel. Got, Cain got mad, killed Abel. So it sort of seems like uh, the vegetarians have been mad at the meat eaters ever since. <laughs> but seriously, even though in the physical realm Cain killed Abel, Jesus says that Satan was the real murderer. Satan personally motivated Cain to kill his brother. What was the question? Why does the devil kill believers? Cain's a, I mean, Abel's a hero of faith in Hebrews 11. The devil loves to kill God's people. Abel was that first hero of faith. And he's listed in connection to creation in Genesis 11. Everything goes back to creation. We studied why God rejected Cain. Because it was disobedience in the details. Did it ever occur to you that God is a detailed person? <laughs> the very hairs of your head are numbered. Not a sparrow falls without your father. The very details of everything, not just general big events, are controlled by God. And God says disobedience in the details is rebellion. We've talked about that in our morning worship as well. We talked about light not being able to tolerate darkness, how men want to think that they're good even when they are evil, and we talked about that where the Apostle John, again speaking back toward creation, says in John 3.19, and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. It's very important to remember that evil people who are motivated by the devil can never stand it when a righteous person stands up to them and tells them that there's a different opinion which is called the truth. And when true righteousness is set next to their dirtiness, which they want to call good, and it proves that they are not good, they go berserk. They've got to get rid of the light that exposes their filth. Jesus was perfect, but the Sanhedrin had to get rid of him because he was making them look bad. The other verse in the New Testament that mentions Cain, which we talked about and has bearing on our text in Revelation, is Jude 111. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gain, saying of Korah. Now last week I read that entire passage out of Jude because it mentions the war between Michael the archangel and the devil when they disputed about the body of Moses. But here we find, once again, two of the people that are mentioned in relation to the churches in the book of Revelation. Cain and Balaam are mentioned there. The reason the verse about Cain is important is because he is paralleled with Balaam. And the way of Cain, we learned the three elements of it. I'll give them to you real quickly if you didn't write them down last time. Number one, the way of Cain involves, number one, defective obedience. He did bring a sacrifice, but not the one that God required. Number two, his worship was self-willed and therefore it was inadequate worship. When you determine what you want to do, regardless of what God requires, the work of your own hands instead of the sacrifice God asks for, don't get mad. Cain did. Cain got in serious trouble for that because he had a salvation by works theology rather than salvation by the blood of a spotless substitute which foreshadows Christ. And then the third way of Cain is murder. Cain was the first murderer in the history of man, and that secret murder, remember it was a secret murder, he thought he was going to cover it up. God said, the blood of your brother is crying out of the ground to me. It's certainly in the religious history of the Roman Catholic Church, so-called, which is plastered with murder and intrigue. So we tried to put it together as we finished up Pergamos, 
Merely using the blunt tool of murder has never stopped and will never stop the spread of true Christianity. Two churches that fell had problems with Nicolaitans. Nobody goes by the name Nicolaitan today, but there are many churches with the Nicolaitan nature. We concluded that the Nicolaitans can be divided into two halves. Number one, the evil doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Number two, the immoral practices of the Nicolaitans. And that's why Thyatira follows Pergamos, because the immoral practice was flooding the church at Thyatira. I'll talk about that more in a minute, the Lord willing. There were different approaches to dealing with the Nicolaitans, and that's the key to why one church fell quickly and one fell slowly. Pergamos fell quickly, Ephesus fell slowly, but they both fell. Ephesus handled the Nicolaitans with strict rejection. Pergamos compromised with the Nicolaitans in an attempt to remain relevant and connected to their culture, which was much to the damage of that church. In between Ephesus and Pergamos, Christ sent his message to Smyrna, the church that refused to compromise in either doctrine or practice, and suffered terribly as a result. Folks, just understand it. Compromise does not bring blessing. It ultimately brings destruction. But that's the church that's still alive today, the church at Smyrna. Even though Ephesus hated the Nicolaitans, that was not enough. Being negative is never enough. Paul had prophesied the defection and destruction of the church at Ephesus in his farewell to the Ephesian elders in chapter 20 of Acts. And so it happened, even though it was the most doctrinally sound of the seven churches. Pergamos fell slowly, uh, quickly, but Eph uh, Pergamos fell quickly, but Ephesus fell slowly. First obvious observation, sound doctrine will always stand in the way of apostasy and the death of a church, and it will slow it down, but it will not stop it. Remember Ephesus. I think most of you know that Dr. McIntyre wrote the book called Death of a Church, how the PCUSA fell away from sound doctrine, ultimately turned apostate in doctrine and grotesque immoral practices where they sponsor homosexual conferences today and, you know, do all kinds of horrible pagan things. Second obvious observation, love for Christ is the most important personal qualification for the continued life of the church. We see that at Smyrna. We see it as actually mentioned in relation to Thyatira. But Thyatira had some really big problems with a particular female teacher who's called Jezebel here in the text. And who knows, perhaps her name really was that. When other loves creep in, the first love is lost and the heirs of the Nicolaitans will win and the church will defect from Christ and it will die. Ephesus had lost their first love. Sort of like marriage. A woman gets interested in another man, she loses her first love, and soon the marriage dies. A man gets interested in another woman, soon the marriage dies, and it's over. In contrast, Smyrna fiercely, intensely loved the Lord Jesus Christ. Even though they didn't have the rich doctrinal heritage of Ephesus, they're still around. Although Ephesus rejected the doctrine and practice of the Nicolaitans, Satan used the prophesied defection and corruption of the elders at Ephesus to drag them into other false doctrine that ended in horrible immoral practices like Israel in the days of Balaam. That immorality among the priests, prelates, and top echelons of Rome, including popes, has been the heritage of the Roman Catholic so-called church for centuries. And that, of course, is the perfect introduction for church number four, Thyatira. The bottom line is the devil finally got the church at Ephesus after a long period of seduction and absorbing the culture through one, divisions in leadership, and two, an ecumenical council, the Council of Ephesus in 431. The devil loves to seal what God's people have built. Now we move into Thyatira and we learn some things. Remember what happened when the Council of Ephesus made Mary, on the same level as Jesus, and gave her supremacy. That was at Ephesus, folks, the church at Ephesus, where the Council of Ephesus took place in 431. 
where Mary was exalted. A female goddess. Well, let me tell you, there's some lessons from that. God never ordained female leadership in the church. I know that's not popular today. But God never ordained female leadership in the church. And that goes back to this worship of Mary stuff. That's spiritual leadership. But God never ordained physical female leadership in the church either. And that brings us to the sex cult at Thyatira. The issue is the same today as those who claim that they have so-called Christian liberty to engage in immorality as long as they are in love. At Pergamos, the key that Satan used to crush the church was the church leadership brought what they thought would make the church thrive and grow. They assimilated their culture and had a loose view of so-called Christian liberty. But it was not true Christian liberty, only a counterfeit. And the same thing was going on at Thyatira. I hope you remember this definition. You've heard me say it probably a hundred times since I've been here over the last 11 years. Christian liberty is not the right to do what you want to do. True Christian liberty is the power to do what you ought to do. Christian liberty has nothing to do with rights. It has to do with empowerment. It has nothing to do with serving the flesh. It has to do with holiness. It's not the right to do what you want to do. It's the power, the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to do what you ought to do. There is Christian liberty, but that's what it is, not what the world says that it is. What you want to do is merely a statement of your old sin nature, the sinful flesh, trying to take control of your thoughts, words, deeds, attitudes, and motives. A loose view of Christian liberty will always end in doctrinal compromise. It will always end in the lowering of moral standards. It will always end with a hazy sense of fitting in with the culture and ultimately judgment by God and death of the church. And I think that's where the church movement in modern church finds itself today. So beware when somebody tells you that you must make the church relevant to the culture if you want to grow. Did you know God never told us to make the church relevant? God never, you won't find any verses in the Bible that says, thou shalt make the church relevant or anything even like that. God never told us make the church relevant. What he told us to do was to call sinners to repentance. Relevance or repentance? God says repentance. Relevance is of the devil. And I tell you, the only thing that's truly relevant is to understand that you're lost and headed for hell and only the grace of Christ can save you. If you want to make the church relevant biblically, you're going to tell people what they don't like to hear. That there is a God in heaven who is holy and that you as a human being on earth are sinful. And someday there's going to come a judgment and you will stand before Almighty God And if you've not trusted Christ, you will burn in hell. Nobody preaches hell anymore. It's painful. You can listen to all the radio preachers that you like and all the the big, you know, television stars that are wearing their diamonds and there's glitzy suits that have sequins in them and big poofy hair and all that stuff. They never preach about hell, unless to deny it. Dear people, that's biblical relevance when you call sinners to repentance. Relevance where the church reflects the world is ungodly immorality and will destroy the church. We do have liberty in Christ, but it relates to holiness, not immorality. Repentance is what is truly relevant in our sin-saturated society. The modern church leaders who are spewing the loose view of so-called Christian liberty garbage are the spiritual heirs of the Nicolaitans and the spiritual heirs of Jezebel at Thyatira. Remember, Pergamos was where the devil lived. They had Satan's seat. 
But the depths of Satan were Thyatira. That's where you got into his deep stuff. He lived at Pergamos. It says so in the text. But the depths of Satan were at Thyatira. See some real parallels between these two locations. That both areas were obviously hotbeds of demonic activity, just like Collingswood is with its pro-homosexual culture. Final application, there's an important lesson for us. Doctrine won't keep a church alive. There must be a passionate love for Christ as well. Money won't keep a church going. It's people. If a church is growing with committed people who have a passionate love for Christ and sound doctrine, it will survive. So we have to focus on two things. We have doctrine. So we need to focus on our love for Christ and reaching people with the gospel of Christ. So that summary of Pergamos also applies to Thyatira. At Pergamos, they were reminded that the final authority was the word of God. Same thing at Thyatira. They're reminded that the final authority is the word of God. Both Pergamos and Thyatira had a few good things going for their churches, but they obviously had not taken a stand on moral issues and separation from worldliness. As a result, fornication was rampant in both of the churches in a perverted form of so-called Christian liberty. At Thyatira, both fornication and adultery are mentioned. And remember, fornication is much broader than adultery. Fornication includes every form of of sexual sin outside of God-ordained marriage between one man and one woman till death do them part. And of course, uh, the devil and the world have invented a lot of other gross sex sins that perverts are practicing today. But the final authority is the scripture, not what makes them feel good. Both Pergamos and Thyatira had fallen into the trap of But it feels so good. How can it be wrong? You know, actually, years ago, I was teaching in a, uh, as an adjunct professor at a Bible college in Birmingham. And um, some of the students actually made that comment. But it feels so good. How can it be wrong? People, that's Pergamos. That's Thyatira. And that was at a Bible college. You understand this has permeated the evangelical church. I'm not talking about some liberal left-wing, you know, seminary that went to the liberals back in the 1920s. I'm talking about a Bible college that had a doctrinal statement that you would approve. And yet there the students were, and they thought it was okay. Because it feels so good, how can it be wrong? The final authority is the word of God. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even through the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of the joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Remember, God sees you that way. You can't cover it up. The Bible reveals our real motives, especially if they are designed to stimulate the flesh. Verse 13 says that you're naked when God looks at your heart. You will never fool him. There are four commendations that we saw to the church at Pergamos. There are six commendations to Thyatira. And both of them had the devil in their midst. One where the devil dwelt and the other one had the depths of Satan. Dear people, this morning I was talking about spiritual warfare, wasn't I? I was talking about why we can have confidence in the midst of spiritual warfare, but you need to understand the devil is out to kill you if he can. And if he can't do that, he will destroy you like he did the church at Pergamos and like he did the church at Thyatira. And you're learning some of the methods that he uses as we go through these churches. Never ignore the sharp two-edged sword on the issue of worldliness. 
Now, Revelation chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, which is back there on the church at Pergamos, it gives us the transition from Pergamos to Thyatira. The fornication plot of Balaam and things sacrificed to idols, both of which are mentioned at Thyatira. Look at Revelation 2, 14. But I have a few things against thee, this is Pergamos, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Those are the two things that we also see at Thyatira. And we've studied Balaam in detail, so I'm not going to bore you by going back over that. A humongous long study about Balaam and the doctrine of Balaam and all the things that fit into the doctrine of Balaam. But the two key issues that are pulled out here in relation to these two churches are number one, fornication. Remember, Balaam told Balak, look, send your pretty Moabite girls into there and let them uh, start, you know, having love affairs with the Israelite boys and God himself will judge them. And they were so bad that they were doing it in front of the tabernacle, you know, out in the open and Moses and the people who were still holy were praying to God to do something and Phineas took a javelin and he ran into the tent and he stabbed these two people through, you know, with a, a javelin and God stopped the plague that he'd already sent out. God isn't pleased with that kind of stuff going on in a church, just like he wasn't with Israel. But anyway, so sacrificed idols, commit fornication. Now let's talk about, for a moment, the things sacrificed unto idols, because that's one of the accusations that Jesus makes against Thyatira, against Jezebel in Revelation. So jump down to verse 20 now. Verse 14 was Pergamos. Now we see verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. That's what he said about Pergamos back in 14, to eat things sacrificed to idols and commit fornication. Here we find it again with Thyatira. Now, the Apostle Paul has some specific instructions on the issue of things sacrificed to idols. Some people have tried to set Paul in opposition to John here. But I'd like to look at a number of passages and see what Paul is saying about things sacrificed to idols. Because clearly Jesus isn't happy with what was going on at the church at uh, Pergamos, and he was definitely not happy about what was going on at the church at Thyatira. The first place that we want to look at is Romans 2.22, because Paul mentions both issues that were problems in Thyatira, which are adultery and idols. So Romans chapter 2 and verse 22. Thou sayest a man should not commit adultery. Dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? So he's saying, now what is Paul driving at as we're going through Romans chapter 2? You remember that Paul gives in Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 2 and Romans chapter 3 the ways in which every man is responsible for knowing God. Romans chapter 1 is the light of creation. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Even somebody out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, stuck on an island, you know, with no contact with anybody else, he's under condemnation because he can know something about God his eternal power and Godhead so that he's without excuse just by looking at creation around him. Romans chapter 2 dealt with the light of conscience, their conscience bearing witness, either accusing or excusing themselves. Romans chapter 3 deals with special revelation that God gave to the Jews the scriptures. And of course, that's the one that holds us most, most accountable. But all men are under condemnation from creation, from conscience, and the scripture. Now that's the context of Romans chapter 2 verse 22 where he mentions both adultery and mentions things that are offered to idols. And he says you might be doing it in your heart because he's dealing with conscience there. Now let's move away from that for just a second. He expands on that issue in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. That's your next passage. I hope you're writing down some of these passages. You need to know where these passages are located because I'm moving pretty quick here tonight. I've only got 15 more minutes. So let's uh, see what we can get. He expands on the issue in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 where he has an extended discussion on whether or not a Christian should eat things that have been offered as sacrifice to idols. And that's what we have going on over in Revelation. 
both at Pergamos and at Thyatira. And notice something else. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, he does it in the context of Christian liberty, what is real Christian liberty and what is not Christian liberty. I'm going to start reading at verse 1 because, I mean, he's talking right on point to what we have over in the book of Revelation. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, so <laughs> here's things offered unto idols, okay, that's our topic. We know that we all have knowledge. When we're talking about knowledge, we're talking about we know sound doctrine. I think we'd all say that. We know that we all have knowledge. Folks, it's not enough. You know why? He tells you in the next phrase. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Oh, Ephesus. This is to Corinth, but wasn't that what we saw at Ephesus? Ephesus had knowledge. They had doctrine. They were founded by Paul. Paul himself had appointed the elders. They lasted for 400 years. They didn't die immediately like Pergamos. But what didn't they have? Thou hast left thy first love. We see suddenly the same two things here discussed at Corinth. You've got knowledge. But you know what it's making you do? It's making you get proud. Because you're missing something. Charity, that's the word agape. That's love. You're getting puffed up, but love builds up. That's what the word edifieth means. You think you got it good because, man, you have got your catechism memorized. Ah, I sure feel good about that. What are you missing? Paul writes it to the church at Corinth. And that was a wild bunch of people. You know what? They had some of the same problems that you see at Pergamos and Thyatira when it comes to immorality. A guy who's sleeping with his father's wife. People coming to the Lord's table and gluttonizing and getting drunk and getting killed. Do you understand that these are common problems that we're dealing with here in the church? We need to understand how they apply to us. Because this is, let the Spirit, uh, hear what, what, you, what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Let him that hath ears to hear, hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. That includes us. I don't want to spend too long on that, but knowledge puffs up. That'll make you swell up. But charity builds up others. If any man think that he know anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. You think you know a lot, you don't know anything. It's the most ignorant people that think they know the most. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. We're talking Ephesus all over again here. As concerning therefore, now let's get to the point. How do you apply it? When you have the basic Bible doctrine, when you have God's kind of love, and the church is functioning the way it should, so now let's put in that context the business about eating things offered to idols. It'll help us figure out what's going on at Thyatira. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, here's what we know. So he's going to talk about first, knowledge. And boy, you got it down solid. We know, we're back to that knowledge issue, that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. Now, is that sound doctrine? Yes. Idols are nothing. It's a piece of rock. It's a piece of wood. You know, it's some kind of a bamboo thing that they wove together and made look like a funny little monkey. 
It's nothing in this world. Because after all, there is only one God. We believe in the Trinity. One God existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we know that as we drive by that Sikh temple down there, that whatever they've got poked out front, or that Catholic church with the statue of Saint so-and-so holding the cross, we know that those idols are nothing because there's only one God. So we got our knowledge down okay, right? For though there be that are called gods, verse 8, uh, 5, I mean, though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, I mean, everybody around, you know, you're seeing people worship all kinds of stuff. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things. In other words, he's the creator, and we by him. He's our creator. So we know this. Sound doctrine. But look at verse 7. Howbeit, there is not in every man that knowledge. Did that ever occur to you? <laughs> there are people that don't know that for sure. For some, with conscience of the idol, unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. He's not just talking about the pagans out there. He's talking about Christians who were converted out of idol-worshiping paganism. And they have an entire raft full of baggage that they have dragged with them as they came to Christ and trusted him for salvation. And in the back of their conscience, they remember the horrible things that they used to do when they went and worshiped the idols. The horrible things that they did after they had eaten of the sacrifices given to the idols, and then how they had been involved in immorality with the temple prostitutes. And that was going on at Corinth. Yes, that was. Their conscience being weak is defiled. Now Paul's going to make the point that it's not the meat itself that is important. He says that in the next verse. For meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. In other words, that's not really the issue. Too many people focus on, well, the technical thing here is. Paul is talking bigger things than that. He's talking about what you are doing in relation to a weaker brother. But meat commendeth it not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. Now, here we have it, Christian liberty. Are you free to eat that kind of stuff? Yeah, but take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Oh, stumbling block. Do you remember that from the book of Revelation? Balaam taught Balak to do what? To cast a stumbling block. Here's a way to trip them up. Now I'm going to make a comment about that in just a second. But, you know, there are too many parallels here to think that Jezebel had never heard the teaching of Paul. But I'll talk about that in a moment. To become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Four. If any man see thee which hath knowledge. Now you've got the knowledge. You've got your doctrine down sound. The idol is nothing. It's no big deal. And that meat are good cuts of meat. I mean, the pagans bring their best sacrifices to the idol. And then the priests can't eat all that meat. They're all vegetarians. <laughs> no, they can't eat all that meat. And so they take it and sell it in the market at a cheap discounted price. And you think, man, I want to buy some meat. And that's really good meat. You go into the pagan temple and there the meat's laid out and you say, man, I like that roast right there. Hey, we'll sell it to you for half price. Think, man, that's good. 
and you sit down or maybe even brought your barbecue grill with you or they'll grill it for you and uh, you sit in there eating your meat if any man see thee which hath knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols so you're both eating it and it's doing you no problems not even giving you indigestion it's fresh and it's good so hey you're doing okay but here's a weak brother he comes by and he says wow that's an elder in the church wow I, I guess it's okay because I really did used to like buying my meat here and here he's sitting and eating I mean and all the idols are still around here and I used to do that but then after I did that then I would go into the temple and do some other bad things he's the weaker brother it will embolden him to eat those things that are offered to idols and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. He gets pulled back into it. Many, many years ago, my dad was uh, in a church that I will not mention. It was already going apostate at that time. He preached many, many revivals and he would have different speakers come and one man who spoke with him at revivals used to be an alcoholic and um, the man made a comment that I will remember for a long time he says you know I used to go into all the bars at such and such a location and it was always a temptation whenever I'd go past those bars to go back inside again even though I trusted Christ and he changed my life. So he says, I found a new route to go home. So I never would go past any of those bars again. You see, people who've been involved in certain things in the past, it's very dangerous for them to get close to the things that drew them into sin in the past and those who are mature Christians will take utmost precaution not to cause this younger weaker brother to be drawn back into things which in and of themselves eating meat that was offered to an idol is no big deal but it emboldens them to get back into other things and the context both here and in Revelation is immorality which is always wrong through thy knowledge you got your doctrine you got it in your hip pocket you pull it out and read one of them every week shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died but when ye sin so against the brethren. That's you guys who've got the knowledge. You guys who've got the doctrine. But you don't have charity. When you insist on your rights. You're blasting a weaker brother. The strong brother is not the one who insists on his rights. The strong brother is the one who gives up his rights for the sake of the weaker brother. I'll give you another illustration. I think I've used this illustration before, but let me say it again because it illustrates the point. Back when I lived in San Antonio many, many years ago, I was a teenager, young man, worked at a radio station called KDRY, which stood for Keep Dry. <laughs> It was owned by Sam Morris, the great voice of temperance in the Southwest. His father had been an alcoholic and would come home every night and beat his mother and beat him in a drunken stupor. 
And Sam Morris determined as a boy he would never touch alcohol and he would do everything he could to fight alcohol in San Antonio. And there were a bunch of breweries in San Antonio. There was Lone Star Brewery, there was Pearl Brewery. I don't know, they probably got more now. And he fought it over his radio station all the time. And the breweries and the bars hated him. And one day he was on a, a trip where he stopped at an airport and because the, the group was delayed, uh, the, the airlines had uh, opened up their executive lounge for everybody to sit around in. And, and everybody signed in as they went in there that they had been in the executive lounge of the airport for this particular airline. And Sam Morris was on that trip and he signed his name in it. He walked in and he saw at the back was a bar that was serving liquor. He was furious. He ran out. He grabbed the page where his name was. He ripped it out. He shredded it. Now, was he the weaker brother? He didn't want anybody to know that he'd been in a place where they served liquor. Was he the weaker brother? No. The weaker brother would be the one that sees Sam Morris walk into the place that has the bar and maybe sit down at the bar and though he doesn't have a drink, maybe has a sandwich. Now, Brother Sam's with the Lord. He was a good man. I worked for him for a while, was an announcer at his radio station. But he's not the weaker brother. The one who's the weaker brother is the one who doesn't say anything to you. He's the one who's quiet. But he's watching you because you're his hero. You're his example. You're the one that he's trying to learn from. You're the one that he's trying to follow. Parents, listen, that's you in relation to your children. You who call yourselves mature Christians, you who've got all that knowledge, this is for you. The weaker brother is the one that you may not even know is a weaker brother. You might not even know he's a Christian. But he knows about you. He's heard about you. He sees you. Maybe somebody at work has told him that person's a Christian. And he thinks, well, I don't want to let anybody know I'm a Christian yet, but I'd sure like to see how, how somebody who's been a Christian a long time is going to handle these situations. You know, when we have our office parties, and uh, what's he going to do? What's she going to do? And they watch you. How are you going to handle it? That's the weaker brother. Through thy knowledge, you know it. It's not going to be a big deal for you. You know it. But shall your knowledge, through your knowledge, shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? When ye sin so for you, when you do that, it is sin. God says so. It's not just, oh, well, let them grow up. You can't say that. Oh, come on, they'll come along someday. I've got Christian liberty. I can do what I want to do. No, that is not Christian liberty. Christian liberty is not the right to do what you want to do. That's flesh. Christian liberty is the power to do what you ought to do. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Now he's not talking about reprimanding or reproving a brother who's involved in sin. He's talking about giving up your rights for another brother or sister in Christ. That's going to help us a lot when we get over to Revelation here. We're giving the background for it. Our time is up, but so that's 1 Corinthians 8. When we get to chapter 9, Paul talks about his right to marry, but how he's given it up. His right to get paid, but how he's given it up. And then how he witnesses to both Jews and Gentiles and how to earn heavenly rewards. So he starts off with meat off the idols. He has a right, but he'll do it. he won't do it if it offends a weaker brother. He has the right to marry, but he's chosen not to do it. He has the right to get paid, but he's chosen not to take it. Although he says the church ought to pay the pastor in that passage. So he gives a series of three different illustrations before he gets back to the business about meat offered to idols, which is in chapter 10, and our time is up. We're going to have to stop there. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power, because it is powerful. It tells us that we need to grow up, those of us who think that we are really know everything, that we've got it all together. 
And who cares about what other Christians worry about? We don't worry about their conscience. After all, we're doing okay with you. And yet, Father, we're showing gross immaturity when we insist on our own rights instead of insisting on helping the weaker brother to grow in Christ. Father, we pray that as we study the church of Thyatira and as we discuss this issue about eating things that were sacrificed to idols, that we'll understand the greater principle, the overarching principle, and why Thyatira had gotten into such wickedness because they thought it was okay and it was their right to do it. Father, please take your word and use it in our hearts to the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight, if I can get there, is number 516, Redeemed, How I Love to Proclaim It. We'll stand and sing all the verses of number 516. 